Numbats are truly unique in the animal kingdom. The numbat is the only marsupial with a diet of termites and also the only one active during the day. As such, it is extremely different from all other living marsupials. In the description, I have included a document with the copyright information for the images used, as well as some of the research papers that I found useful. There are three main groups of mammals. The first is the monotremes, or egg-laying mammals. This is a small group, and the only living species of the platypus and echidnas. I already have a video on these, so check that out if you are interested. The next group is the one we will be talking about today, the marsupials. The last group of Eutheria contains all other living mammals, from cats to whales to horses. Eutheria all give birth to live young, which are nourished inside their mother using the placenta, leading to their common name of placental mammals. The development of the placenta allows these mammals to be much more fully developed when born. Although many of these species are still born helpless, they are far more developed than newborn marsupials are. So, back to the marsupials. Marsupials are not nearly as widespread as placental mammals. They are mostly found in Central and South America, Australia, and some of the islands in Southeast Asia. Aside from these, the Virginia opossum is found in North America, and the common brush-tailed possum is an invasive species in New Zealand. There are no marsupials at all in Africa, Europe, and mainland Asia. Marsupials are set apart from other mammals due to their reproductive strategy, specifically how they give birth to and care for their young. Young marsupials are called joeys. You may have heard this word for a baby kangaroo, but joey is used for all marsupials. It doesn't matter whether it is a kangaroo, wombat, possum or numbat. They all have joeys. Marsupials have very short gestation periods compared to placental mammals. The shortest is the striped-faced dunnet, which only has an average of 10.7 days. The longest for a marsupial is the long-nosed potaroo, with 38 days. All other marsupials fall somewhere between these two extremes, but we are talking about a matter of a couple of weeks from conception to giving birth, which is incredibly short when compared to the months it takes for most placental mammals. Of course, the trade-off is that the young are born extremely underdeveloped, being little more than a fetus. The stage of development of the newborn joey varies a little between the species, but it is roughly equivalent to the developmental stage of an 8-12 to week old human fetus. Although it is born blind and hairless, the newborn joey can crawl over the mother's fur to locate her pouch. Almost all marsupials have a pouch, and it acts like an external womb. The joey crawls inside and locates one of its mother's teats to feed. Joeys are born with soft tissue around their mouth that leaves them with just a hole large enough for their mother's teat. Once they find a teat, the end of the teat will swell, leaving the joey unable to detach themselves until they are large enough. Joeys cannot regulate their own body temperature and rely on the warmth of their mother to survive. This means that the pouch is typically 30 to 32 degrees Celsius or 86 to 90 Fahrenheit. Joeys complete their developmental stage inside the pouch and will not re-emerge for several months. Even once they are large enough to leave the pouch and start foraging, joeys will return to their mother's pouch for safety and to sleep. Joeys can remain in their mother's pouch for up to a year in some species, or until the next joey is born. Since this method of raising their young is unique to marsupials, it is what they are best known for. There are other differences between marsupials and placental mammals, including some oddities like marsupials lacking a bony kneecap. Marsupials are thought to have originated in South America. When marsupials were diversifying, the South American landmass was still joined to Antarctica and Australia as part of the Gondwanaland supercontinent. At that time, some of these marsupials would have dispersed to modern-day Australia. The phylogeny of marsupials supports this theory, with the South American ones diversifying from the others earlier. The first two groups are sometimes switched depending on the study, but the more recent studies agree that the shrew opossums in Porca tuberculata are the oldest lineage of marsupials. I may as well address this quickly now. I will be using opossum for the American marsupials. I realise that this is often short to possum in North America, but to avoid confusion with the Australian possums, I will keep using their scientifically accurate name. Anyway, there are seven living species of shrew opossum. But this order used to be far more diverse, as many other species are known from the fossil record. The next order is Didelphomorphia, or the opossums. This is a highly diverse order, with 93 species in a single family. 
Many of them are poorly known, although some are classified as critically endangered and possibly extinct. The most well known of these is definitely the Virginia opossum, given its large distribution into North America. Next, we come to the last of the South American orders, and perhaps the most unique one. This is Microbiotheria, which only contains a single living species, the Monito del Monte. It is so unique, as it is more closely related to the Australian marsupials than it is to any of the South American ones. As such, it is an important species for informing our understanding of marsupial evolution, since it shares many features seen in the Australian marsupials, but are absent in the South American ones. Some members of this order did disperse into Australia with the other marsupials, as their fossils have been found in Western Australia, but the direct lineage leading to the Monito del Monte did not go with them. The Australian marsupials are divided into four orders. The first is perhaps the most well known. This is Diprotodontia, which contains such iconic Australian animals as kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, wombats, possums, gliders and many others. In total, this group contains 140 species, over 39 genera, so it is extremely diverse. Next is the marsupial moles, in Notorictidae. Obviously, these are not closely related to the moles they were named after, but they do follow a similar fossorial lifestyle. There are only two living species of marsupial mole. The next order is Paromelamorphia, which contains the bandicoots and bilbies. This group has 19 living species, but their placement in the phylogeny of marsupials has often been controversial. Genetics, as it often does, has resolved this dispute, placing them as the most closely related group to the last order of marsupials, Desiuromorphia. Desiuromorphia is actually our group of interest today. It contains the carnivorous marsupials. This common name is a little misleading, although at least most of the living carnivorous Australian marsupials are in this order. The only exceptions to this are the marsupial moles, as well as the omnivorous bandicoots. However, all three orders of South American marsupials contain carnivores or omnivores. There are three families within this order, although most species are in a single family. The first of these families is Thylacinidae, which contains the extinct thylacine. I actually have a video coming out on them soon, so keep an eye out for it. Next is Myrmecobiidae, which contains the numbat. This is obviously the topic of this video, so we will return to it in a minute. The third and by far largest family is Desiuridae. While the other two families only had one modern species each, Desiuridae has 72 species. These are broadly divided into two subfamilies and contains many interesting Australian animals. This is extremely simplified here, but the first subfamily contains a lot of marsupials that look a little like mice or shrews, many of which are not well known by most people. This includes Mulgaras, Antichinuses, Fiskergales, and Desiures. There are two genera in this subfamily that are more well known and also look a little less rodent like. These are the Tasmanian Devil and the Quolls. The other subfamily is a bit smaller, but the species in it still look quite similar to rodents. It includes dunnets, ninguais, planigales, and the coltar. The family, Myrmecobiidae, is a monotypic family. This means that it only has one genus, but in the case of Myrmecobiidae, that genus is also monotypic, only containing a single species, the numbat. This is usually the part of the video where I would have a look at some of its extinct ancestors especially since we are only dealing with a single species. However, there is a slight problem with that. There are no known extinct or prehistoric members of this family. A few numbat fossils have been found, but these are only dated back to the Pleistocene, a period spanning from around 2.5 million years ago to the end of the last ice age, about 11 to 12,000 years ago. Phylogenetic studies suggest that numbats diversified from the rest of Desiuromorphia in the late Eocene or early Oligocene, around 32 to 42 million years ago. This leaves a massive gap in the fossil record where we simply have no evidence for how the present day numbat evolved and no record of any closely related species. The numbat, Myrmecobius fasciatus, is also known as the Numbat or Wilperti. These unusual names come from different Aboriginal languages, which I will apologise in advance for the pronunciation of them. 
Numbat and Noombat come from the Nyunga language from Southeast Australia, while Wilperti is from the Pitjantjantjara dialect of the Western Desert language from the Pitjantjantjara people of Central Australia. In English, it is occasionally also known as the banded anteater or marsupial anteater. As these names suggest, it is an insectivore, although it eats termites, not ants. The numbat is small, only being between 35 to 45 centimetres long, or 14 to 18 inches, including its tail. They are highly distinctive, with a small pointed muzzle and a large bushy tail. Its coloration can vary, but it is typically soft grey or reddish brown. They have white stripes on their back and hindquarters, and a black line from the point of their snout through their eye. The numbat used to have two subspecies, but the rusty coloured numbat went extinct in the 1960s, only leaving the nominate subspecies alive today. Not all sources agree that the rusty coloured numbat was a separate subspecies, and given that it went extinct before genetic testing became commonplace, it is hard to know for sure. But it did at least have a slightly different appearance, with a more reddish coat, so it was visually distinct from the numbats alive today. Much of their range, appearance and behaviours can be explained by their specific diet. The first thing that is noticeable only due to their lack is that numbats do not have large claws. Most termite or anteaters have powerful claws to allow them to break into termite mounds and ant nests. Numbat claws are strong for their size but are nowhere near the strength or durability of something like an aardvark or one of the South American anteaters. As a result, they need to find termites when they are outside of their mounds. This is the reason that numbats are the only marsupial that is completely diurnal. All other marsupials are crepuscular or nocturnal, only rarely being active during the day. Numbats do not have this option. Termites usually leave their mounds during the day, so that is when the numbats need to be active to feed. Numbats even vary the amount of time they are active to match termites. During summer, they often forage in the morning and evening, retreating to their nests for the hottest part of the day. Termites are sensitive to light and heat, so often avoid the hottest part of an Australian summer day. But, during winter, they may only be active for a few hours during the warmest part of the day, again to match the termites. Although they lack powerful claws, numbats do share other physical features with other ant and termite specialists. The first is that they lack functional teeth. They do have up to 50 small teeth, but these are remnants and are not typically used. Their jaws can chew, but they rarely do this as there is no need with their soft-bodied prey. For some reason, they are the only terrestrial mammal with an extra cheek tooth which is located between their molars and premolars. Given that they rarely, if ever, use their teeth, it is unknown why they have this extra tooth, with one suggestion being that it is a baby tooth that has been retained into adulthood. Numbats have a long, narrow tongue, similar to other anteaters. The tongue is covered in their saliva, making it very sticky. They use this to easily gather up termites. They have numerous ridges on their soft palate in their mouth, which is used to scrape the trapped insects off their tongue. They can do this process very quickly, and can eat up to 20,000 termites every day. Internally, their digestive system is very simple, and lacks many adaptations found among other anteaters. This might be due to termites having a much softer exoskeleton than ants, and so being easier to digest. Of course, numbats are only convergently evolved to look similar to anteaters like the aardvark. They are not closely related. So it is certainly possible that some of these features which are useful in other anteaters simply never eventuated in the numbats, even if it is something that may have been a useful adaptation. Unrelated to their diet, but numbat kidneys do not show adaptations that are expected from an animal living in an arid environment. Most desert or subdesert animals have specialised kidneys to reduce their water loss, an important adaptation for creatures living in an environment with little water. Numbat kidneys, however, do not show these adaptations. They are fairly typical mammalian kidneys, with little to no efforts to reduce water loss. Because of this, it is believed that numbats get a lot of their water requirements from their prey, and so conserving water was not a feature they evolved. Numbats find termite mounds using scent, but they also have the best eyesight of any marsupial. This is not really surprising, given their diurnal lifestyle, as nocturnal animals have little need for colour vision. Numbats, on the other hand, have the highest proportion of cone cells in their retina of all marsupials, suggesting that they have excellent colour vision. So, although they find their prey with scent, it is believed that sight is their main sense for locating potential threats. 
Numbats are solitary and territorial. They establish a range of 1.5 square kilometres or half a square mile. They will defend their territory from numbats of the same sex, but they can overlap with individuals of the opposite sex. During the breeding season, males may roam from their normal territory to find a mate. This breeding season is from February to March, and so late summer or early autumn. They usually produce one litter a year, although can make a second one if the first is lost. Gestation lasts for 14 days, and they have four joeys per litter. Extremely unusually for a marsupial, numbats do not have pouches. The young will crawl over their mother to her teats and will remain attached for around five to six months, until they are large enough that the mother cannot properly walk while carrying them. At this time, she will deposit them in the nest and return to suckle them. Once they are nine months old, they will start to forage with their mother, eating some termites. They are fully weaned at around 10 to 11 months old. The joeys leave the nest and become fully independent at around 12 months old. Females are sexually mature at one year old, so just as they leave their mother's nest, while males wait an extra year until they are two. Their lifespan in the wild is around four to five years old, although they can live up to 10 in captivity. Historically, numbats were found on a wide swath of western and southern Australia, but they are now extinct in most of this range. Today, their surviving populations are only found in small patches in western Australia, and there are estimated to be less than 1,000 left in the wild. They have been successfully reintroduced into fenced predator-proof areas of western Australia, South Australia and New South Wales. The IUCN lists them as endangered, and invasive species seem to be a major threat. In the Dryandra woodland, one of their two remaining completely wild populations, measures were introduced to eliminate feral cats. A survey of numbats in this area in 2018 only found five individuals. These measures do seem to have helped, as a survey only two years later in 2020 found 35 numbats, the most recorded in the area since the 1990s. Invasive red foxes also prey on numbats. Following a fox control effort using poison bait, numbat numbers also massively increased. Of course, it is not just invasive species that target numbats. Native predators, like various species of eagles, hawks, goannas and pythons will also target them. But, the effects of these are not as significant as numbats have evolved alongside these animals, and so numbats are better at escaping from them. The stripes on their back can act as camouflage from the aerial predators, and they will often freeze if they spot one. Raptors like hawks often rely on movement to locate their prey, so freezing is an effective defence against them. If it is some other danger, then they will run and hide in tree trunks or amongst logs. In fact, it is hypothesised that the two populations that managed to survive only did so because both areas have many hollow logs, which would act as excellent refuge against the introduced cats and foxes. Numbats are not only threatened by invasive predators, they are also highly susceptible to habitat destruction. Numbats rely on woodlands for survival, so when these are cleared for farming, mining or urbanisation, numbats will no longer have any shelter from the predators. Perhaps even more devastatingly, when the land is cleared, termites often die out or move away, leaving numbats with no sources of food. The massive bushfires that Australia often experiences is another major threat, and for the same reasons as humans clearing the land. If one of the bushfires tore through the numbat's current minuscule range, it would decimate the remaining population. Many conservation efforts are directed at saving the numbats. I have already mentioned the pest control in pest-free sanctuaries, but there is also an extensive captive breeding program undertaken by Perth Zoo. Every year, this program releases juvenile numbats into the wild to boost their overall numbers and also try to manage their genetic diversity so the remaining numbats don't become inbred, always a concern with dealing with such a small population. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Numbats are some of my favourite Australian animals. They are fascinating and completely unique in the animal kingdom. Unfortunately, they are struggling to survive, only living in a fraction of their former habitat. At least, the conservation efforts over the last 30 years are promising at ensuring their continued survival. Thank you for listening and feel free to let me know other groups of animals you would like to learn about in the comments.